In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today is going to come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're continuing our series there. And this is a part of 1 Samuel because we, we've been dealing a lot with the more obscure part. Everybody kind of knows the story of David or is at least familiar with it if you've ever been in church or gone to church for any consistent amount of time. This is a Bible story that gets used a lot, and, and for good reason. I mean, it's a fantastic story, one of my favorite ones in the whole Scripture, one of the reasons that I decided to do this as a series. That we've been mostly dealing with the part of 1 Samuel that is lesser known, the, the pre-David part of the book of Samuel, where it mostly focuses on Samuel and King Saul and their interaction. Now we're getting to a part of the story that everybody knows. Even people that don't really know anything about the Bible know about Goliath, the giant whom David, of course, slays. So let's take a look at this particular passage of Scripture that talks about Goliath's challenge that he issues to the, the nation of Israel. So we'll look in 1 Samuel 17, verses 8 through 11. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So this is really where it all starts. David has been introduced, but this is the challenge that he is about to face. And it's interesting because even before we get to the part about David, just looking at the, the raw story of Goliath and what he intends to do, normally, and this is something that we're accustomed to as Christians, modern-day Christians, normally evil conceals itself. Normally evil hides itself and sort of sneaks up on people. But there are occasions where evil just steps out into the light and says, here I am. Where it openly acts in rebellion and defiance to God and his will and doesn't even try to hide it. This is one such instance. Normally, it's harder to find the bad guys. It's harder to know that when the demons are in the walls. And we actually see this even contained within the book of 1 Samuel. There are several villains that sort of bubble up in this narrative, including King Saul himself, that were at least at one time perceived as good people or appear to be good people at first glance and you have to learn that they're really bad people. Goliath, there's no mystery here. He just comes out and says openly, I defy Israel and I defy all of the people here. I am defying your God. This is essentially the challenge that Goliath was offering to everybody else. And we know from his physical description, he is a giant. He's a, he's a big, big dude. He's at least nine feet tall based on the measurements. You know, Bible measurements are a little off. It's, it's hard to tell, but we can tell relatively, virtually, uh, his, the area of height that he is. He's, he's roughly nine feet tall based on the way that the Bible describes him with the, the cubit system. But even though evil does usually conceal itself, this is one time where he just walks right out into the open and when it does conceal itself, usually, or when it, when it refuses to conceal itself, when it just comes out in the open and says, here I am, usually that's a fear play. What that evil is trying to do is to scare you into backing down. It wants to show itself to be so big and so powerful and so overwhelming and so insurmountable that everybody else just cowers in a corner and doesn't want to defy it. When you're facing that kind of evil... That's normally the plot. That, that's, that's the thing that it is trying to do is instill fear into everybody so that it doesn't fight back. You see, when it conceals itself, it doesn't really need to do that because it's concealing itself hoping that nobody will notice that it's evil and thus not attack it. 
In this instant, it's trying to say, I'm so big and so powerful and so scary that nobody can stand up against me and then scare you into not doing so. But here's the thing. The reason that works is because fear is contagious. Courage is contagious too, but so is fear. When you see somebody that is afraid of something, we instinctively as human beings think, ooh, maybe I need to be afraid of that too. When you see somebody holding back or terrified of something, if we can see that, we perceive that, especially if it's somebody that we trust and that we like, it automatically makes us take a second look and go, maybe I need to be afraid of that too. It's possible that there were men in Israel's army that despite Goliath being a very big, intimidating individual, they would have challenged him if they had met him in open confrontation on the battlefield. But because this challenge was issued this way and everybody's looking around and going, ooh, everybody else is terrified of this guy. They don't think that they have a chance of beating him. Maybe I should be afraid too. That nobody had the courage to step out and answer Goliath's challenge. And here's another thing that's important to note from this story as well. Most of the time, bullies are bluster and they're pushovers. They're not nearly as tough as they say they are. They're not nearly as tough as they talk like they are. In Goliath's case, it was real. Goliath is absolutely able of handling himself. Now, he winds up, of course, being easily defeated a few verses later by David because of God's help. But ultimately, this is not an indication that Goliath is not a big deal, that, he's not a, that he is some kind of pushover, that all they had to do was stand up to the bully, and then it was going to be an easy fight. Uh, no, that's not the story of Goliath at all. Now, compared to God, Goliath is nothing. But compared to the other people here, he probably would have beaten everybody in that army. Just because he's a bully does not mean that he's a pushover or that he's something that's easily surmountable. And when we're facing the giants in our life, just because an evil is there, just because it announces itself, just because it is something that is keeping us down or holding us back does not mean it's insignificant. Sometimes it is. Sometimes all we need to do is show a little bit of courage and we can overcome it. There are some cases where that's not true. There are some cases where we have to fight really hard to be able to overcome whatever it is in our life that is holding us back. But the fact that Goliath stands in open rebellion to Israel, which translates to open rebellion against God. He is standing against God, God's people. He actually taunts God in several ways. Uh, we'll see that later in the scripture. But he comes out against Israel, and he rebels against God. So the question is, why didn't God just strike him down there? Like, let's say Goliath is walking out, and he issues this, and he is in open defiance against God and talking smack about Israel and about God. Wouldn't it be, have been pretty convincing of God's power for a lightning bolt to just fall out of heaven and strike him dead right there? I mean, that would have been quite a spectacle to see. And the way that some people think about God, that would have made the most sense. Why doesn't God do that? There's a couple of different reasons. First, obviously, this was something that winds up setting David up for everybody in Israel knowing who he is and setting him up for his, you know, rise to power. That's probably part of it. I'm sure there's a number of other things, but I think the biggest issue, the biggest reason that God chose to dispatch Goliath in this way is because God does his best work when he's working through a human, which is a weird thing to say. But remember that he accomplished the greatest achievement in all of human history, the salvation from sin, while he was wrapped in flesh. God always does his best work when he's doing it through a human being. I don't know why that is. I don't know why he chooses to do it that way. I have some theories. But ultimately, what I do think it all comes to is that because human beings can see another human being step up somebody as small and relatively insignificant as David, stand up to somebody like this? See, that inspires fear, or that inspires courage in them as well. And it also motivates you to act. Because it kind of reminds me of a scene in Andy Griffith where Opie, not unlike David and Goliath, has been having a problem with a bully that's taking his lunch money every day. And Barney, because remember, they are police officers. His, his dad's a sheriff. 
He says, why don't we just go and stop it? And Andy says, well, what happens when he's older? Do we just run in and solve every problem that he has? You see, Andy understood that Opie needed to face his giant. And I think God understood that Israel needed to face their giant too. I mean, yeah, ending Goliath's life, just striking him dead with a lightning bolt, that would have been quite a spectacle and, and probably would have inspired a good deal of fear in Israel. But God doesn't want to just rush in and solve every single problem that we have. He wants us to learn and to grow and to mature and to be able to face up to our own sin ourselves. Now, he's going to be there every step of the way. When David finally did step up to face down Goliath, God's providence was there with him. But he wanted David to have the courage of conviction, the courage of his faith, and also that courage to inspire others to stand up to Goliath on his own. And then God did the rest. All he had to do was stand up to the giants facing him, and God provided everything else that he needed. Why is it that no Israelite, except for David, looked at Goliath's challenge and saw it as a challenge to God, that thought about, well, if I challenge him because God's on the side of Israel, because we're the ones that are in the right, and because God has made this covenant with our nation, that he's going to protect me too. Why is David the first person that comes up with that thesis and acts on it? I think that's why he becomes king, isn't it? If there was ever a case study of the qualities that made David ready to be king or, or prepared to be the next king of Israel, I think that that's pretty much it. That David saw Israel as God's and his responsibility and that he had faith that he was going to watch over Israel, take care of Israel, all of that. And because of that, he has the courage to act and to do and to lead. And it's the same calling that we have as Christians to be leaders among other men to inspire others to follow God's word. You see, everybody's got a Goliath. Everybody. I don't care who you are, how rich, how poor, what your background is, what your skin color is. Everybody has a Goliath in their life. But the difference is not everybody has a God to help them take down that Goliath. There's a lot of people that face their Goliaths without God in their corner. And that's sad. Because they're not going to beat that giant. They're not going to overcome that obstacle. As long as we have God, we can overcome it. But if you're facing down a Goliath and you don't have God in your corner, that's not a good position to be in. And that's the reason that God wants to be with us. He wants to help us. He wants to take down the giants for us. But he does expect us to step up and stand for him in order to do so, just like he did with David. Stay the course, friends. People ask me all the time, Caleb, how do you stay in such great shape? Well, let me tell you, it's not easy. The Secret is a steady diet consisting mostly of likes and subscriptions, especially the ones where the person hits the notification bell. That's what actually gives me my superhuman strength. Likes, as it turns out, are very high in protein and iron. Sadly, doesn't do anything for your hair. <laughs>